Thank you for listening to Emmanuel Baptist Church's podcast. For more information about the church, please visit our website at www.emmanuelmanning.com. Thanks and enjoy the sermon. All right, let's uh, read together Revelation 21 and 22. Revelation 21 and 22 as we finish out this morning by God's grace. Uh, this wonderful capstone of all scripture. John writes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars... Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at, the 12, uh, and at the gates 12 angels. And on the gates the names of the 12 tribes of the son of Israel were inscribed on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square and its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper while the city was of pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth uh, chrysophras, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl, and the streets of the city were was pure gold like transparent glass and I saw no temple in the city for its temple is the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb and the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and its lamp is the Lamb by its light will the nations walk and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it and its gates will never be shut by day and there will be no night there they will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations but nothing unclean will ever enter it nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those whose names are written uh, in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. And they will need no light of lamp 
or son, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And he said, These words are trustworthy and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things, and when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said, You must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And he said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about the things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who desires take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Richard Baxter was a very famous and effective pastor in England in the 1600s. He's written a couple of the great books uh, in history since the Reformation. He wrote one called The Reformed Pastor, which is still a book I'm trying to live up to. Uh, He wrote a book uh, on anxiety and depression and the remedies of it that is still a text used today in many places. He also wrote a book called The Saints Everlasting Rest, which is a really a meditation on one verse out of Hebrews which says there remains for us the people of God a rest. And he wrote about 800 pages on that one verse. Why in the world would someone write 800 pages on the idea of the end? Well, his whole adult adult life was spent battling one sickness after another. He had a constant cough, frequent nosebleeds, migraines, digestive ailments, kidney stones, and gallstones. He believed in supernatural healing and said on a few occasions he actually was healed. Yet bodily suffering was with him to the end And he once said from the age of 21, he was seldom an hour free from pain. One of the effects of this suffering was to make him intensely conscious of how temporary his life is and how inevitable death is. What he decided to do one time when he was 35, he was bed bound by one of his diseases and thought he may not recover. So he said, I'm just going to spend a little while thinking about heaven thinking about the new heavens and the new earth, thinking about the end of all of God's plan. And it was such an encouragement to his soul that he decided to do that for a half an hour every day. Towards the end of his life, he wrote this. If you would have light and heat, why are you not more in the sunshine? For lack of this recourse to heaven, your soul is as a lamp not lighted and your duty as a sacrifice without fire. Fetch one coal daily from this altar and see if your offering will not burn. Keep close to this reviving fire and see if your affections will not be warmed. Baxter knew pain every hour of his life from the time he was 21 until his death, and yet he was able to be a fruitful person who left a legacy. And he would say that the reason he was able to leave this legacy is because he thought early and often of the new heavens and the new earth, what he called the saints' everlasting rest. And I cannot 
stress to you how important this is because every decision that you make, every move that you make, every action that you do in one way or another is connected to the deepest hope of your soul. And what the Bible says and what I want to offer to you this morning is that the Bible offers the deepest hope and any other hope that you live for will leave you high and dry. And so really this morning is going to be a review because since I've been here, in the 10 years I've been here, I've preached a lot about the new heavens and the new earth because I feel like it's one of the missing ingredients in modern Christianity. I've said this before and I just can't say it enough because I feel like hopefully as a church together we're in a paradigm shift and if we're going to be in a paradigm shift together we've got to constantly go back and review first principles. And one of the first principles that I want us to have as a church just past God as who he is and the gospel really is the embodied hope that we have for a new heaven and a new earth. Because most of modern Christianity really is following the teachings of the philosopher Plato. Now we've said this before, but again, just reviewing these first principles where we think that God's final destiny and goal for us is that we all as disembodied spirits go and be with him in heaven, which is why we have all of these images of heaven sort of being like a disembodied forever worship service where we worship God forever. And what we spend a lot of our lives doing is trying to make that not boring. Can I get an amen? Uh, and, and because this is our one shot at living life and seeing things, we spend a lot of our life scurrying and hurrying around because one day we're going to have to, as uh, Shakespeare said, and he had a better theology than Plato, but we're going to shuffle off this mortal coil, we're going to lay down this prison house of the body, and we're going to go fly away uh, to the spirits disembodied forever in heaven, sitting on a cloud, playing harps, munching carrots like Bugs Bunny. I would say that our theology of heaven probably comes more from Bugs Bunny than it does from the Bible. Because the Bible doesn't picture us as future disembodied souls in heaven. As a matter of fact, as the Bible ends, the trajectory of everything isn't all the good stuff from here going up to heaven. The final trajectory of the Bible is all the good stuff in heaven coming down here. And the Lord is going to renew and remake this earth and we will live forever according to the plan that he had. And so this morning, I want us to think again about the promise of the new heavens and new earth. And I've got seven points, so I've got to be quick. I know that. I'm usually not good at it, but we'll see what happens. But what else are you going to do today? Go home and watch TV? Where you're going to be uh, catechized by television in the kinds of hope you should have, which is usually nothing more than the next dollar or the next sexual experience. And what we have to offer this morning from the Word of God is a hope that will not let us down. Maybe this morning we should practice meditating on this. And so I have seven points, and they all start this way. In the new heavens and the new earth, dot, dot, dot. All right? So let's blow through these and then let's apply them. In the new heavens and the new earth, number one, the original plan of God will be wrapped up. In the new heavens and in the new earth, the original plan, excuse me, the original plan of God will be wrapped up. What do I mean by that? Well, again, the Lord didn't admit failure when Adam fell in the garden. And many of us think that way, that post-Adam, that God went to some kind of plan B that is now, the future is disembodied and de-earthed. And what Revelation 21 and 22 teach us is that in the end, God is going to go back to his original plan. What was God's original plan? And what is God's plan for you? Remember back back in the Garden of Eden, we often misunderstand this as well as if the whole earth was really amazing and then Adam messed it up and then the whole earth got really bad. In reality, the Bible says that the earth was kind of chaotic and empty and void. And what God did is he set up some structures Uh, to govern it and he planted in a part of it a land and in that land in the east he put a garden the garden of eden and we've said all this as we went through exodus that that little garden was a whole lot like a temple right 
And what Adam's job was to do, because God wanted his creation, mankind to do this, is God wanted to take that little temple garden and he wanted him to have a whole bunch of babies so that he and his babies could take that garden and spread it all over the earth so that the waters would, the, the glory of God would cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And what happened is Adam fell into sin, thorns and thistles grew up, and that project of God through man spreading his glory all over the earth as the waters cover the sea was short-circuited and was in some ways cast aside. And so the earth was cursed. And so what the Lord did is throughout history, he called different men to sort of try and again live out that idea of taking the glory of God in his temple and spreading it all over the earth. That's what the Israelites were to do. They were to be a holy people that would serve as priests for the whole earth so that the whole earth would come and worship God. But Israel failed one after another. Abraham failed. Isaac failed. Jacob failed. You go down to David, this great king. Things start off well. What happened with David? He failed. His son Solomon, what happened with him? He failed. And then the prophets come along just to let us all know that Israel as a whole failed. And so it seems like time and time again, this plan that God has, that through mankind, God's glory would spread all over the earth, gets short-circuited and short-circuited and short-circuited until Jesus comes. And then what happens is we forget that in Jesus, not only did he die for us so that he could uh, make us God's own children, the Bible says that he died for us, that he could make us the temple of God. And Jesus not only died to save us, Jesus also came so that in humanity, in a man, God would be able to fulfill his final purpose, which is to make the whole earth a temple for the glory of his name. And here's the deal. Jesus is not going to fail at it. He stands for This is why you're created. You should be excited about this. You weren't created to make the next buck, to make the next deal, to have the next encounter, to see the next sight. You were made to be a part of God's plan that all of the earth would be covered with his glory. And now because of Jesus, who came as a man to be the new Adam, Jesus is the man. Now through him, you're given his spirit so that you can be a part of God's project. And what we see here at the end with the new heavens and the new earth is that in Jesus, the new Adam, God's original plan is going to be wrapped up because but through Jesus' work, ultimately, the heavens and the earth are going to be that temple of God forever. That's why there's so many allusions back to the garden. In Revelation 21 and 22, we have the, the river that comes out that feeds the nations. We have the, the tree of life that somehow weirdly is on both sides of that river. It's a symbolic book, right? The tree is on both sides of the river. I know that's not literal, but that'd be a cool tree to see. We have so many pictures coming from Genesis 1 that are wrapped up here in Revelation 22. And so we see, and this is again one of the things that we have to do to fill out our idea of Christianity. One of the things that we have to do is we have to see that Jesus did not just come to earn our redemption. Jesus came to make sure that God's original project for man was ultimately fulfilled. And what we see in Revelation 21 and 22 is that in Jesus, everything is going to be reconciled. I went this week off topic number one. Here we go. One point. I'm already leaving the, the page. I went this week to a seminar on poverty with a bunch of pastors and a bunch of workers. And they talked about poverty and understanding the mindset of poverty. And it was amazing. And I'd love for you all to hear it. You probably will hear it at some point and how we can help people in poverty but one of the things that was not done that was frustrating to me, as good as it was and as helpful as it was, and it was done by people who've done more than I do, but one of the things that was unhelpful is that pastors talked about how to get this going in churches. None of them actually tied it to the gospel. Now, the thing is, is if we're just a bunch of souls who are going to be disembodied floating in heaven, then it doesn't seem to me that working against poverty in this age is a work of the gospel. It's just kind of a thing you do in order to get people in a place where they can hear the gospel so that then they can receive the gospel and be disembodied souls in heaven. But if the original plan is that Jesus is reconciling everything to himself and seeking to bring heaven to earth, it seems to me 
that there is a gospel motivation to actually bring an end to poverty near us. That we actually work for the good of people because those people are either going to be forever dwelling on this earth in glory and bliss or they're going to be forever in hell. And that Jesus wants all things, even the poor, to be. He wants people to experience this in growing measure even now. And part of the work of the gospel is that he is going to bring his kingdom on this earth. So we should be about all the kingdom earth and work. And surely that most certainly means bringing people into his discipleship. But it also means as we bring them into his discipleship, bringing them out of poverty. This goes right to the heart of the gospel. The second point that we see is that in the new heavens and the new earth, well, the heavens and the earth will be renewed. John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth passed away and the sea was no more. This doesn't mean that God's going to pick up and create a new solar system. He could if he wanted to. The hope of the prophets seems to be that this earth and this heaven are made new, that God is going to renovate the whole thing, a kind of global rehab project, and everything futile and evil and painful will be done away with. This is what it says in Romans 8, 21, the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the liberty of the glory of the children of God. In other words, this earth is hoping that we will soon be shown to be the sons of God when Jesus comes back because when we are renewed, it will be renewed. And again, I think you guys know that um, you're going to think I'm a liberal after today because I'm talking about poverty. But let me tell you the second thing I want to talk about. If this heaven and this earth are going to be renewed then part of a good gospel project is seeking to renew the heavens and the earth now as well. I read an article this week in National Geographic about how little fish in the ocean find these spots that kind of have an oil slick on them because that's where like their food goes. And so they go and they eat off the bottom of these oil slicks, not literal oil, but you know, like oily things, uh, not bad oil. But their food gets caught up in this, and lots and lots of fish are dying because our plastic is all caught in that stuff as well. And it's ruining stuff. And again, am I some eco-tree hugger? Have you ever heard me preach about this? But I'm telling you, if we want to really begin to reach the next generation, we're going to have to have a good gospel-based uh, idea of stewardship of the earth, or we're going to lose it, the next generation. Uh, because the Bible says that we're stewards of this earth that is going to be renewed. And because we've sort of had an escapist mindset for a long time, when they talk about cleaning plastic up out of the ocean, we go, well, as long as souls are saved, who cares? I, I think God cares. I, I think God cares. Y'all aren't feeling me, are you? I think God cares. Yeah, I think he cares that we, like, take care of it. When he makes natural stuff, he makes stuff that makes it stuff and doesn't ruin other stuff. We should try that. Now again, do, do we have plastic cups in our kitchen? Yeah, we do. But maybe we should think, and again, should we like, we can't get crazy headed about this. We can't let people starve while we go and clean up the oceans, but we kind of can not worry that some people do focus on that because God cares about that as well. You should grow a garden. You should plant flowers because this creation is longing to not be in decay. So in the new heavens and new earth, this heaven and earth will be renewed. Second Peter says that all of the evil elements, which is talks about evil spirits, will be burned up off of it. In a moment, Jesus will make it what it was intended to be, which is a garden. The Greek word for garden that they translated the Hebrew word garden, gone, the, the Greek word they translated it into was paradisio, a little paradise. Planting a garden is not a waste of time. Caring about picking up trash is not a waste of time. We should be good stewards because this heaven and this earth will be renewed 
it will be freed from its bondage to decay and it's waiting. Number three, in the new heavens and the new earth, we will be given glorified bodies. This might be my favorite. One pastor says there are a lot of people who feel like they, got, they didn't get a fair shake when the bodies were passed out. How many of you feel like you weren't given a fair shake when the bodies were passed out? Some people have dramatic deformities. Some have lost limbs. Some are paralyzed. Some can't hear. Some can't see. Some have all kinds of problems. I'm going to the doctor tomorrow because I think I have cancer on my head. I don't know. It may just be a spot. Maybe my second brain finding its way out. I'm not sure. Some of us have uh, degenerative diseases. And the Bible says that in a moment when Jesus returns, we'll be given glorified bodies. Philippians 3, 20 and 21 says this. Our commonwealth is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will change the body of our lowliness to be like the body of his glory, according to the working by which he is able to subdue all things to himself. In this new heaven and new earth, Paul makes this distinction between physical fleshly bodies and spiritual bodies. And by that, he doesn't mean bodies that are composed of spirit. He means bodies that are completely open and receptive to the life-giving generative power of the Holy Spirit. And so that in a moment, all of our ailments and all of our weakness, uh, all of our disease, all of our deformity will be done away with in a moment. That's why Paul says in Romans 6, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. A new body, it will never die again. It will never hurt again. It will never cry again, except to cry for joy. Number four, in the new heavens and the new earth, all death and all chaos will be removed and we will finally be safe. All death and all chaos will be removed and we will finally be safe. I've pointed this out before, but look at Revelation 21.1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the blank was no more. And the sea was no more. Do you see that? The sea had taken on kind of a, uh, an, an idea in the Hebrew mind. So they, they weren't a seafaring people. The sea kind of churned. It was constantly chaotic. And while there were seafaring people around Israel, Israel wasn't very much known as one. We've already seen in Revelation, where do all the bad guys come up out of? The sea. Where does Leviathan live in the Old Testament? The sea. So the sea represented chaos. And so when it says in the new heavens and the new earth, there will be no longer any sea, we have to remember this is a symbolic book because earlier in the book, when John saw the glory of God, it was something at his feet. What was it? A sea of crystal like glass. In other words, the sea becomes still. And that symbolic language to say this, that in the new heavens and the new earth, there won't be any more chaos. Babylon made herself rich off the sea. So in chapter 18 and 19, when Babylon is destroyed, it's these seafaring people who cry the hardest. Not only do we see that the sea is removed, but we also see an interesting thing about the city. It has walls, but the walls are really more for decoration than they are for security because the walls are made out of all kinds of crystals and all kinds of gems. You heard me trying to pronounce that. Look at verse 19 in chapter 21. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. What were walls for in the ancient Near East? Safety and protection. You had to get inside the wall at night because outside the wall was danger. Here there are walls, but the walls aren't for protection. The walls are for hanging art. Why? Because in the new heavens and the new earth, death and chaos will be removed and everything will make us safe. And I could, I prayed to the Lord this morning. I can't scream about this, although I feel like screaming about it. I can't make this land home in your heart. Only God can. But I do know this, that there are underlying currents in our lives that make everything difficult. 
And we often don't think about them because these things are just the water in which we swim. They're the air in which we walk. And what are these three things? Number one, people can't be trusted. Death is facing us all, and we're not safe. People can't be trusted. Death is facing us all, and we're not safe. I am an OCD-ish kind of person, so every night I have three doors to lock and to make sure that I've locked every door, because if I'm not sure I've locked every door, it doesn't matter what time of the night it is, what am I gonna get up and do? Yeah, and so I have three doors, and I'll, you remember the old NBC theme? NBC. So I, I lock each door and I do a tone, so I know if I've gone through the tones, you're like, we're, we're seeing inside of your wicked and wretched head, welcome. So fr front door, and back door, B, garage door, C. And if I've done, the, that's a good idea, isn't it? Your OCD people attach it to a song, and then you won't get up at 2.30 in the morning wondering if you locked the door. You'll stay up wondering if all the windows are locked. <laughs> Why do I do that? Well, I got kids, and there are people in this world who'd want to hurt them. People can't be trusted. People lie. We lie. We, that's why we have these uh, unending paperwork. How would you like a life without paperwork? Welcome to the new heavens and new earth. Gentlemen's agreements with handshakes. Right? Death is facing us all. What would life be like for you? Now, there's a sense in which for us, death is the thing that makes everything important. But the reason that death has to make everything important is because we're the kind of people who if we weren't facing death, our heart is not full of worship and we will waste all our time. But what would it be like if your heart was fully engaged, fully worshiping, and you didn't face death at every moment? What if not only you were undying, but you were also good? And what will it be like when you don't need to feel threatened by anything? This is why in Isaiah and some of the prophecies about this time, it talks about children playing around the holes of snakes. I hate snakes. What would life be like if death and chaos were removed and you, you literally never had to worry about your safety? This is what Jesus died to bring. And this is what he will bring. In the new heavens and new earth, number five, there will be no unrighteous people. Look at verse 8. Chapter 21, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Revelation is full of a lot of nasty things. But what you have to understand is the reason that Revelation is full of a lot of nasty things is because the world is full of a lot of nasty people and God's people have a lot of nasty enemies. I've told you this before. If you want to sum up the entire Bible in one sentence, here's what it is. Kill the dragon, get the girl. Right? Kill the dragon, get the girl. That's, that's what's behind every good story. Kill the dragon, get the girl. And guys, we're part of the girl. Right? Why? We see all this nasty stuff and we think God must be really mean. Let me tell you what all this nasty stuff tells us. God is really in love. And he's a warrior who's going to go and defend and get his bride. We don't like all of the death and destruction. We may not like that there are people who will be cast into the lake that burns with fire. But the bottom line is the reason that God does this is because he's going to remove every obstacle from his wife being happy. He's really in love with his church. And because of that, there will not be unrighteous people in the new heavens and the new earth. And the South especially is really littered with people who think that they're okay because they signed a card. I have people that I know and love who are baptized and think that they are okay and have lived for a year in, in decency uh, and in adultery. And love says, you need to stop. You need to let that go. You need to be characterized by faithfulness instead of faithlessness because there will not be any cowardly people or faithless people or detestable or murderers or sexually immoral people or sorcerers or idolaters or liars in the new heaven and the new earth. 
but you won't be there. This is why Paul says in Galatians 5 that people who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's not because God is mean. It's because he's in love with his wife. You should join it. Because if your life is characterized by these things, and the crazy thing is all of these things are the very thing that the world says is where life is. But the new heavens and the new earth will not be peopled by the unrighteous. That's why it says in verse 27 of chapter 21, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. You're like, Drew, I've done each of those things. I know, but we're talking about people who are unrepentantly characterized by those things. Jesus says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he says, and if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we will have fellowship with him and our fellowship will be with one another. In other words, we do sin, but when we sin, we step out into the light. And we say, I did it. And God forgives us. The new heavens and new earth will not be peopled by the unrighteous. Number six. The new heavens and the new earth. Oh man, I gotta hurry up. I lied, didn't I? Number six. The new heavens and new earth will be the place where we fully and finally have the relationship with God we were meant to have. Look at verse three of chapter 21. And I heard a loud voice from the throne. This is one of the only couple of times in the book of Revelation where God himself speaks from the throne. And what does he say? He says the thing he's been waiting to say all along. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they'll be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. And he himself will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. The reason there will be none of those things is because we will be close to God. We also know that we'll be close to God because the new Jerusalem is a cube. Did you hear what it said? That its height and its width are the same as as its length. It's a big cube coming down from heaven. And at one point in here, uh, the angel takes it and he measures it. In the Bible, whenever you measure something, that's God's way of saying, this is coming under my protection. And so this cube that comes down from heaven kind of becomes the whole new earth. And the reason it's a cube, and I've told you this before, is because the holy of holies inside the temple, guess what shape it was? A cube. And so what we see is we see that dream of the entire earth being a temple. That's what it's saying here, that it's going to come down from heaven, and in a moment the whole earth will be a temple that is the whole earth will be covered with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea in other words all of the deep longing that you have that nothing in this earth can satisfy it will finally be satiated and satisfied with the presence of God this is why you know G.K. Chesterton said everybody wants to be with God even those who are banging on the door of a brothel this world tells you that you can be satisfied in a person You can be satisfied in this. You can be satisfied with this project. And it all leaves us stale. And we have people in our society left and right who are coming to see that there is nothing on earth that can satisfy them or make them happy. And so they're committing suicide left and right. And what the Bible says is what you're longing for is something that you cannot have yet. You can have in measure. And then one day you will have the presence of God without measure. And it's this promise Jesus says that should be keeping you pure in heart because Jesus said blessed are the pure in heart for they shall what see God see God Paul said we'll no longer walk by faith it'll no longer be hearing his voice in the word and then not seeing but just listening and walking right now the the main recipient the way that we relate to God is mainly through our ears hear O Israel the Lord your God the Lord is one And all the rest of the earth wants to make it our eyes. See this, look at this. But we close our eyes, not to reality, not to the way things are. We close our eyes to the promises that if we look at this or have this, we'll see God. We function through our ears and then there will come this day when God will open up our eyes and we will see him and we will have him and he will be everywhere with us. And 
Number seven. The new heavens and the new earth, listen to me, will be completed in the future, but it is a reality in measure now. And I want to close with what I've been saying about the book of Revelation all along. I do believe that we can not completely, but in some measure, expand that glory of God over the earth now to a significant degree if we would be faithful and hopeful and have a victory mindset. Because the thing is, Revelation 21 and 22 is obviously a riff on Isaiah 65, which talks about the new heavens and the new earth. And I don't have time to go into it now, but the new heavens and the new earth in Isaiah is the new covenant. You may not, it is. Because God is tying the heavens and the earth to the covenant that he has with his people. In Revelation 20, he's just done away with his covenant. And now he's brought in the new covenant in Jesus and Isaiah talks about a time when it will be sad when, a, when like a young person dies into his hundreds. And what I'm saying to you is, if we would live faithfully and with a victorious mindset go out and disciple the nations, we would be bringing this to pass. I do believe that. Because the scripture said that Jesus isn't waiting to be Lord. Jesus is now what? And he's reigning as the Davidic king in God's right hand. And Psalm 2 and Psalm 110 say, basically, I will make all of your enemies your footstool. 1 Corinthians 15, as I've said a hundred times in this series, says that death is the last enemy. Which means that every enemy before death will be defeated. And what we do is we flip it. As if everything's a mess and then Jesus comes back and then all of his enemies become his footstool. And I think we're doing the exact opposite of what the Bible says. This one leads, everything's going to be a mess and then Jesus will come back and fix it. Leads to a defeatist, let's circle the wagons and just stay in the church mindset that we should not have. We should not have it. Because Jesus reigns now and we need to go to our senators and we need to go to our neighbors. And we need to say something like Jesus is reigning now. And we need to disciple the nations and then something amazing will happen. Throughout the Bible, the land is tied to the faithfulness of God's people. That's what Deuteronomy 28 is. Isaiah 66 and 65 are just a riff on Deuteronomy 28. As we disciple the nations, I know this sounds ludicrous, but I'm telling you, I can't see the Bible any other way. As we disciple the nations now, things genuinely get better. Heck, under the influence of the church, things are already better. You think things are terrible everywhere. Fine, you lived 200 years ago. You first. Not me. I like what we got, as bad as it is. And I think under the influence of the gospel, if we would have a victorious mindset, if we would live as if Jesus is Lord, we would begin seeing these things coming to place. And, and because Jesus didn't say, hunker down, and I'll come back one day when it's really bad and fix it all. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. Is that what he said? You're like, well, no, 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 Drew, that means he's, we're going to lose. We're only going to lose because you think you're a loser. You have the authority of Jesus when you speak to your neighbors. You have the truth. You have what will bring life. Go live like it. And what will happen is life will be brought and this earth will be changed. And what has to be completed by God's grace in some sense catastrophically in the future can be a growing reality now. Because it says the new Jerusalem, Paul says in Galatians 4.26, the Jerusalem above is free and she is our mother. Hebrews 12 says, but you've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable angels in festal gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn who are rolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. This is, in some sense, real now. After all, the foundations and the gates of this new Jerusalem are the 12 uh, fathers and the 12 apostles, Right? You're not believing it.
Here's what I'm saying. I'm saying that I, I don't know about the future of America. I don't even know about the future of you. But here's what I believe. The future of the world is bright because Jesus is Lord. And under his lordship, the gospel will rule and reign and bring good things to the nations until he comes back. That's what I believe because I think that's what the Bible teaches. And we've been taught to look at the Bible through a defeatist mindset instead of a victorious mindset. Instead of looking at our neighbor and saying, Jesus is Lord, you should trust him and live for him. We're looking at the skies and we're looking at the news. And what will be true in the future is also in some sense a reality now. The whole way to look at the New Testament is now and not yet. The kingdom is here now, the kingdom is here not yet. Jesus is with us now, Jesus is not completely with us yet, but we work in that tension to bring the not yet as best we can into the now, and then God at his timing will make the not yet now. Is that clear? So how do we apply this very quickly in five minutes? If this is true, and it is, you need to focus your hopes. You need to take your hopes away from the things that your hope is drawn to, and you need to fix them firmly on Jesus' victory and the new heavens and the new earth. This is how Paul talks in Colossians 3.1. If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. We don't have minds to see it because we're not good Bible readers. Seated at the right hand of God means ruling over all things. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things of the earth, for you have died and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Second, not only should you focus your hopes, number two, you should suffer patiently. Paul says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in the hope the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we eagerly await our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Number three. You should be content because you will see the end and you will be satisfied. Anybody remember the Jeffersons? What is is all the Jeffersons about? That they finally got their piece of the pie, right? Beans don't burn in the kitchen. Something, beans don't burn on the grill. Took a whole lot of Turai in just to get up that hill. Now we're up in the big leagues, big east, big something. Big league taking our turn at best. As long as we're here, it's you and me, baby. There ain't nothing wrong with us. Well, we're moving on up. But what is the subtext of the whole show? George has everything and he's not content. Or my childhood crush was Belinda Carlisle. Ooh, baby, do you know what that's worth? Ooh, heaven is a place on earth. They say in heaven, love comes first. We'll make heaven a place on earth. It ain't going to happen. Things will get better. But our true hope lies for when Jesus returns, even as we work now to make things better and bring his kingdom as best we can, he will fully bring it in. So many marriages break up, so many lives end because we cannot be content thinking that things on this earth will satisfy. They will not. They will leave you high and dry. Enjoy everything you can that you can be thankful for under God's hand, but realize that no marriage, no person, no job, no uh, package No vacation, no nothing is ever going to satisfy your heart because you were made for God and God is coming. Number four, take risks. John Piper says this, if somebody falls out of an airplane with no parachute on and you don't have one either, you're not going to jump after them. It won't do any good. Two deaths aren't better than one. But if you have a parachute, you just might try one of those awesome rescue attempts where you free fall like a bullet to catch the helpless and pull your cord. It's the hope of safety in the end that releases radical sacrificial love now. In other words, I want so badly to go to, you won't even know what I'm talking about. I'm a huge Manchester United soccer fan. 
One of my life goals is to go to Old Trafford in Manchester and see a game of Manchester United. I want to go do a tour of Germany where I see all of the Reformation sites. There are so many things in this world I would love to see that I may never until. And so what happens is instead of spending my life trying to save my money up so I can make it to Old Trafford, which is a stadium, by the way, um, I can be generous with my money now knowing that I will see everything I ever want to see when Jesus remakes the, the earth. Fifth, don't get bored with heaven. Get excited about the new earth. And sixth, don't go to hell. Don't go to hell. You don't have to. You don't have to live that way. You don't have to be unrepentant. You don't have to be miserable in the sin you think is making you happy. Don't go to hell. Number seven, seven points, seven applications, three minutes and we're done. Don't fear death. There's a pastor named Donald Gray Barnhouse. He wrote a very long commentary on Romans. At one point, he was one of America's leading Bible teachers. His wife died of cancer when he had three young children. And one day after his wife died, uh, he was driving in the city and he had his three kids with him. As a matter of fact, it was really close to the funeral of his wife. And a um, bus drove by. It was, in, it was in New York City, I think. And the bus drove by and it you know, kind of, Whoa! you know how that goes and sometimes that can catch you off guard and you're scared. And all of a sudden the shadow passed and it got really dark and it scared his daughter. And Barnhouse said this, he said, tell me, hon honey, would you rather be run over by the truck or by its shadow? Um, and she said, I guess I'd rather be run over by the shadow. He said, that's all that your mom has done. She's only been hit by the shadow of death. You only live under the shadow of death because the real death, Jesus already took. He took the bus. You just feel the shadow. And so we need not fear death because one day, Jesus, by the power that he has to subject all things to himself, is going to completely erase it and take it away forever because he's king and he's a good one. And so because of that, you need not fear death. You just need to fear not being faithful. Jesus on the cross took the bus so you would only ever take the shadow. And he's the one who can offer real life, so we need not live the shadow life either. Let's go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for revelation. We thank you for the 10 months we've spent in it. We just ask your blessing upon our lives that we would live in light of what is our true hope, which is Jesus remaking everything. Lord, help us to live in light of that and expand our colony of heaven here now as we await for everything to be made right when Jesus returns. We pray this in his name.